infection within Queensland Health, which includes, amongst other things, uh, the communicable disease control and environmental health areas. Uh, and so it's interesting to uh, come to a conference like this and, and hear where the research is going. I suppose hopefully I can contribute what it means in, in a, it, what it means to someone who's working in the healthcare system from a public health point of view, not necessarily from a healthcare service point of view. I just want to acknowledge uh, quite a few of the staff who've been involved in, in material that I've used uh, for this presentation. So. In thinking about um, the health impact of climate change, we need to think about how does it apply in Queensland, and I think it's, it's not as clear as, uh, to me, from where I sit, um, as it needs to be in, in making decisions about the allocation of resources, particularly given that there's, there's often countervailing um, sort of pressures, and I'll come back to that. And, when we think about the pressures that climate change um, will bring, and um, I think the the concept that was that was promoted around mental health that it's about exacerbating or, or having a greater effect on existing dynamics, uh, I think is a good way of thinking about the public health risk. And so, for public health practitioners who have to respond to public health risks, what? How do we think about the notion of do we have the ability to respond? Are we able to cope with it? And so I'm going to talk a little bit about what happened with the recent disasters and the public health response to that to give a sense of what, what it takes uh, a healthcare system in terms of public health outcomes. And so then my own personal reflections about what do we mean by public health capacity and what then is the ad adaptation task for public health agencies like ourselves. So now this people will have seen, but I've added a few things from my perspective in, in the, from the original work that was done. And one is to start to recognise that climate change adaptation measures have their risks in their own right. And, and the point about rainwater tanks that Scott made before is a very important one, that, that we've been very busily putting them in all over the place to cope with drought, and we're about to face a risk in its own right. Uh, the social cohesion uh, in the drought, where everybody got out and helped everybody else, you'll see also had its own health impact in its own right. So we need to think both in terms of the measures, what climate change will do, but also think carefully about mitigating risks associated, associated with adaptation. I think when we think about disaster and, and diseases, I think we need to be very careful about understanding what drives uh, risk mitigation, you know, infrastructure, for example, when it comes to waterborne disease or food safety regulatory systems that actually prevent increase in foodborne illness. So when we think of, uh, and you outline possible risks like heat waves or, or foodborne illness or diseases, there's a lot of systems in place that actually work to, to mitigate them. And so we need to maintain those systems. So. Uh, just to give you a sense of what health protection really means in Queensland, um, when we have a disaster, and I'll use it, uh, that example, you've got health protection functions at the national level, but ma mainly the expertise sits at the state level within the state health services. And in Queensland, we've got 14 public health units. There's one here in Cairns, Townsville, and major urban centres uh, all down the coast, uh, as well as Toowoomba. Uh, and you get a, the number of staff, we have 66 disease control staff, 108 environmental health officers. Now, these are important figures because these are the people you get to throw out a disaster. We've got public health, uh, we've got some policy units who also undertake um, uh, advisory roles centrally, and we're also responding, responsible for managing a public health response to a disaster. Uh, we've also got our laboratories, which are an incredibly important part of the way we, of our work. And we work in a network across governments, not just health departments, but it's other agencies like the Safe Food Production Aid uh, Authority, uh, Workplace Health and Safety, Department of en Environment and Resource Management, in the essence of also public health regulators. We also shouldn't forget that public health uh, control measures occur at the local level as well with environmental health officers in local government. Now, that's important background to understand that 
uh, how we respond to a, to a disaster. So people will know very well that Queensland had been, went through a season of disasters, three waves from my perspective. The first wave was what happened in southeast Queensland and, and Rockhampton and Emerald. Then came the Brisbane flood, uh, Brisbane and southeast Queensland flood with the, you know, what happened in Toowoomba and Grantham the day before, or a couple of days before. And then the third phase was Cyclone Yazi in North Queensland. But by the end of it, 72 out of 73 local councils in Queensland were disaster declared. And 65 continue to remain disaster declared. Now, the one damage bill we found was around $5.8 billion, billion dollars, and, and I think that's an underestimate from what I gather. And I, I did have trouble finding an up-to-date estimate of cost. So the impact was entirely across the state, and we were, had to respond to it. Um, sorry. So this, when responding to a disaster to try and prevent public health harm, you've got three parts of the system. You've got the healthcare services, the hospitals, and to illustrate, here in Cairns, before Cyclone Yazi hit, the entire hospital was evacuated. That's 300 patients. So that was one part of the system, the healthcare services. The second part of the healthcare system, which operated uh, a separate incident management system, linked but separate, was the public health component, uh, where, where, which was where I, I was responsible for leading. And the third was the mental health, the health and social, uh, oh, I forget the term, but the mental health component, which, which the mental health services worked with community services to respond to. And you can see them in three different ways. The first response is the healthcare services trying to evacuate people out of the out of the zone. There weren't a lot of injuries, but there were some demands on healthcare services uh, because of cuts to power and isolation of, of say, general practice. So accidental emergency, emergency centres were under a lot of pressure. Uh, the second wave was the public health risks, and that came in second. And the third one, which is still continuing, is the impact on, on mental health of the community. So I'm focusing on that second wave that really begins the day after. Uh, we're focused, we're trying to mitigate the harm because obviously in a disaster, the fundamental protection of public health, uh, the systems are broken down. And so you, you, the fundamentals of water safety, food safety, housing, all the basics of public health that we take for granted are actually under threat. So our job is to monitor what's going on and to endeavour to mitigate that and working with through the state disaster management system. And these are the sorts of areas that we had to focus on. Uh, but there was a lot of, and these are figures from Queensland Health. You also have to take into account the local government had a part to play. We had, you know, we had to go out and look at um, food businesses. This is the Brisbane data. 27 premises required disposal of drugs. We had to bring in a mosquito, a mosquito control programs, particularly for Ross River uh, type mosquitoes um, in central Queensland. And we have had to arrange the deployment of a whole lot of, uh, mos of EHOs, environmental health officers, to support local government. Because one of the big things we know is that local government has very few people. So they have one person as their public health advisor at the local government level. And that person cannot work 24 hours a day, nor can they get out and have a look at the food businesses, make sure the mosquito control is underway, advise on what to do about the water risks. Um, we were dealing with situations where we had significant uh, water infrastructure damage right throughout the state, water, system, water treatment plants either underwater or as in Townsville where the power got lost, or in Brisbane where they are dealing with a massive turbid water coming down the... Um, down the, the river towards the water treatment plant and having to cope with that and the pressure that that put on the actual treatment system in a city like Brisbane, which had 50,000 houses without power. So the notion of telling people to boil water would have caused enormous um, difficulties for us. It was a very, it was a, a challenge. Uh, there was also a lot of concern around uh, tetanus uh, and other communicable diseases. People got very excited about tetanus. So I'm, the risk, probably from our perspective, was lower. It was a demand that, that uh, people sought uh, tetanus vaccinations, and so you can see that, that we had to distribute an enormous number of vaccines over the course of the month. 
And we had, and this is a map of Brisbane. You can see we were putting vans, uh, shifting every day to various parts across the, the state, uh, to the city. What I can say is that it, it worked. We didn't have any outbreaks of communicable disease. So while we had 